Hello, I'm Sue Nelson and thanks for joining me on Create the Future, a podcast brought to you by the Queen Elizabeth Prize for Engineering. My guest this week literally aims high, extremely high, in fact, because he's the structural engineer behind the Burj Khalifa, the tallest building in the world. This stunning silver skyscraper in Dubai famously played centre stage alongside Tom Cruise in a Mission Impossible film. And its Y-shaped reinforced concrete tower required a new buttressed core structural system in order to stand a staggering 828 metres high. But there's more to Bill Baker than this engineering marvel. Around the world, his buildings and bridges are impressive and distinctive additions to the landscape, made possible by Skidmore, Owings and Merrill, or SOM, where Bill has worked for over 20 years. After studying civil engineering in Missouri, he gained a master's in Illinois, and today he travels around the world, lectures at the University of Cambridge as an honorary professor, and is also an international fellow of the Royal Academy of Engineering. Bill is based with SOM in Chicago, and since the United States is famous for its skyscrapers, I began by asking Bill what his favourite tall building was when growing up. I grew up in a small town in the middle of uh, of America, middle of Missouri, and so there weren't any tall buildings around. Growing up, no, I can't say I was particularly aware of them. I think the tallest thing in my town was probably three stories. Uh, which I did like. I have to say, uh, one of my favorite buildings of all time that I did see when I was young, maybe didn't appreciate quite as much, was the John Hancock Tower uh, here in here in Chicago, which is that X-braced tall tower that my my firm had done um, in the late sixties, early seventies. Chicago is a beautiful city, though architecturally. Yeah, it, it's uh, actually considered to be the. Uh, in America, the capital of American architecture. And it's interesting, you know, because you know, there's the, there was the first Chicago school, you know, the first skyscrapers were down here in Chicago, which was basically a combination of te- different technology, a structural engineering technology, vertical transportation, the elevators were, were, were coming in, but also the way that changing the, the skin of the building from load bearing to, to what we call a curtain wall something that, that was hung from the structure rather than, than, than being the structure itself. So, so that was very important. And then there, were, then there was the, uh, the second Chicago school, if you will, that happened uh, in the late 30s, 40s. You know, Mies van der Rohe uh, left Germany, came to Chicago, uh, taught at IIT. And so there was really uh, kind of a, a capital of this new modern architecture that came out. And uh, part of it was because unlike cities, say, like London or New York or Hong Kong, where there's a great deal of money and the land is very valuable, in Chicago, the rents aren't so high. And so the buildings had to be very rational and disciplined. If you wanted to have enough money left over to have a nice lobby, you had to be have very efficient systems and very efficient structures. So that, that's what's one of the things, what, the economic pressures that led to the kind of the, the very clean, stripped down architecture of Chicago. And in a way, you've described one of the qualities that an engineer has to have, really, which is not just an eye for the design and the technical skills, but also the practicalities, isn't it, in terms of budget? Yeah, a lot of times one says, you know, design is a search for constraints. The most impossible project is a is a building on a green field with no known use, and no constraints. And so as you layer on the constraints, you define the design problem, and within reason, the, the right constraints uh, can make you have to be more clever. And actually having a tight budget doesn't necessarily limit the design, but it does force more creativity to do something that's interesting. So growing up in a, in a relatively small town, and, uh, and you were also at a university in, in, in Illinois, did mm-hmm. you have... Any indication when you were younger that you were interested in how things were being built? Did you play with 
construction bricks or or build huge towers in a sort of uh, Steven Spielberg sort of close encounters kind of way? Certainly I grew up with the erector set, which I'll sorry for, for building things, you know, we, we all did that. <laughs> kind of an interesting thing, even though I'm from a small town, uh, Fulton, Missouri, it actually, in our hometown, we have a, a church by Sir Christopher Wren, believe it or not. Uh, there's a small college there called Westminster College. And that's where Winston Churchill gave the Iron Curtain speech. When I was growing up, they took a bombed out church from London and, and rebuilt it block by block on campus. And I used to crawl through the construction when I was a kid. Uh, you know, as all kids do, you kind of get, get, get around the construction fence and get into the, get into the construction site. But, you know, but growing up, you know, yeah, we would build things. But actually, you know, small town America, um, we spent a lot of time working on cars, uh, you know, playing with cars and the engines. And back in those days, it was not electronic. It was either mechanical or electrical. And you could actually figure out how to fix it. So it was, it was actually kind of rewarding to take a, a car that wasn't working and make it, make it work. So what made you then decide on studying structural engineering rather than, say, mechanical or electrical engineering? Part of it is, in a small town, I didn't know much about engineering. And so when I was in high school, I took uh, the, you know, the guidance counselors gives you uh, these aptitude tests. And I took an aptitude test and, and indicated that uh, I had a propensity towards engineering. So I went home and asked my mother uh, what an engineer was. Well, it turns out both of my grandfathers had been engineers, structural engineers. So I guess it's in my, my genes. But, but not knowing that at that time, I looked around what engineers did, and I was really impressed with the, um, shall I say, the physical representation you know, that, that a, like a bridge or a building that, you know, the, the, you know just the, the, how tangible it is and how monumental and, and seemingly permanent it is, uh, the things that structural engineers built. And so uh, looking back, and part of it is maybe a little search for immortality. You try to make something that'll be there longer than you. And so, you know, that's certainly part of it. Before I went to graduate school, after I took my, my, my first degree, I worked for an oil company. And I worked in various aspects of it, some mechanical engineering stuff, some chemical engineering uh, uh, duties, some reservoir or petroleum engineering duties. And a lot of those were very challenging mathematically. You can do these incredibly, I'll even say beautiful uh, processes where you, you change the temperature and pressure and these amazing things that you predict actually happen. And, and so and intellectually, very, very rewarding and challenging, but it really wasn't what I wanted to do. I wanted to make things, physical things like buildings or bridges. And so that's when I decided to go back to graduate school at Illinois. I've seen a couple of your, your, your talks and you talk about the importance of maths in the work that you do. And you call it the geometry being this intersection of architecture and mm -hmm. structure. <laughs> geometry is just absolutely fundamental. The space I'm in here, you would describe it in geometrical terms. You know, you use geometric terms, you're describing the, what the works of the Greeks or the Romans, you know. And as you describe the architecture, you would also be describing the structure. Or if you started to try to describe the structure, you would, you would at the same time be describing the architecture. And they, 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 they met in the geometric intersection. But also uh, geometry, I also find very fascinating when I look at a, at a say, a, a bridge, okay, I see the geometry of, of, of the structure, you know, the, say the, maybe it has cables or hangers or trusses or whatever, but I also see the geometry of the equilibrium. It's equally real, but you, you, don't, you don't see it. Like, you know, every node of a truss, you know, there's, a, there's a closed a polygon that, that represents the equilibrium of that joint. And so uh, we've been doing a lot of uh, research on the work of uh, James Clark Maxwell, who was uh, the founder of, uh, of reciprocal diagrams and, shall we say, our graphic statics, where, where you can s you see not only the geometry of the structure, but you see the geometry of the forces. And one of the things I like to do is, is maybe design the forces first and then see what the, the structure looks like. Of course, what you do is you go back and forth between the two. Maybe you, you guess a structure, you see how the forces are, then you then you... You design the forces and see what that does to the structural geometry. So the, it's an incredibly important part of our, of our, of our life, mathematical life and, and, um, and engineering life, is to understand geometry. And quite frankly, geometry is not taught as much as it should be. We've actually been doing deep dives on projective geometry, which was the red-hot mathematics of the 19th century. It's what, what, what Rankin and Maxwell and all the great engineers of the 19th century 
new was projective geometry, which, which actually allows you to see things differently. If I look at a, a, at a say a bridge, a three-dimensional object that's in equilibrium, if I take a photograph of it, I have a two-dimensional representation of a three-dimensional structure. Guess what? That two-dimensional structure is also in equilibrium. Because as you look at it, you know, the projection of the forces and the projection of the geometry follow the same mathematical rules. And so a lot of times it's, it's interesting to look at the, uh, a three-dimensional structure as a series of two-dimensional structures. Say you have a roof, a grid roof, or, or a shell or something. If you look straight down, you see a two-dimensional structure. And what's more interesting, you no longer see gravity. You only see the horizontal reactions to gravity. And so, you know, this, you know, looking at our designs geometrically and understanding the geometry of both the structure and the geometry of equilibrium is a great design tool. It sounds as though you've got a very good feel for not just the forces, the, the maths, the, the engineering, the practical side, the, the design, but also for sort of seeing it as I hate to use the word holistic, um, but it does sound like you use a very holistic approach in order to sort of envisage what you're doing. I think a lot of structural engineers, and it's only really true of architects, are visual people. So a lot of times what, what I try to do is I try to look at the problem. And I actually try to solve it visually or intellectually or heuristically, if you will. I'm a pretty decent mathematician also. I can, I can get in there and, and, do, and do the differential equations and the like. But I actually get my insight uh, by trying to understand it in a visual nature. And I think that comes to the part, you know, where, where, you know, structural engineers are often very, very visual people. And the more you look at things, the more you study them, the you know, deeper and, and richer your intuition becomes. And you can imagine, you know, how you might design something or change, or change an idea and make it something different or better. Well, visual is, is definitely something that, I think people associate with with your work. I have been to Chicago, but I've not seen the Millennium Park pedestrian bridge mm -hmm. that you've built. And when I saw a picture of it, I loved it because it was so curvy and yeah. it looked like a Mobius strip across mm -hmm. a road. It almost looked fluid. Yes. It's, it's another case where a design constraint becomes a design opportunity. This was done with the architect, uh, Frank Gehry. And so uh, if, you, if you're trying to do a bridge over a roadway and you wanted to make it accessible to, to handicapped people, well, you could put it in an elevator or something and you get you up and go in an elevator going down. Or what you can do is you can make the slope so gentle that, that anyone can negotiate it. And so generally a slope of 1 to 20, you know, 5% or less, is considered gentle enough that a handicapped person in a wheelchair or, or walking aids can, can handle that, 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 that very mild slope. But if you have to get up a certain distance and you have to get down a certain distance, you, well, then you have a gentle slope, you need a long length to do it. So how do you, how do you take that required length and then, then, then make it something that it makes it an experience? This is you know, a lot what uh, Frank Gehry and his crew brought to the project was this, creating this experience where you, where you walk back and forth and you... You, you, you know, you, you obviously are on the bridge, but you see the bridge that you're on as you're walking on it. And so you're, you're creating vistas of the city, but the vistas of the bridge itself as you, as, you, as, you, as you walk along it. It's really quite something. I mean, one of the things about it, it did have, in the same way of some of your buildings, it had the wow factor. Mm -hmm. Do you always approach something with the thought of, I've got to make people go wow now. No, actually, I you know I I, I try to make it uh, honest and tell the story of the of, of the structure of the building and try to make it as clean and like I say as honest as I can in such a way that, that the story of the building will come through and, and that's one of the important things of architecture and structural engineering where they come together is how do you take take a building and um, tell the story of the building through the way you express it and, and the like. In London, I, I did a building there at uh, Liverpool Street Station called Exchange House, which uh, spans uh, 78 meters over the tracks going north out of Liverpool Street Station. And it's a building, but it's also a bridge. How do we tell the story of the flow of loads through the structure, you know, uh, from the, from the, floor plates to, you know, to the columns or hangers up to the arch, 
or down to the arch and then how the, the ties work and how the building sits on, on its bearings up there, you know, nine meters in the air. So, so that you, so that you can, you can, you can see the entire resolution of the forces. And then we also wanted to leave remnants of the construction process. So, so that, you know, the building was originally assembled on, on false work. And so the, the, the hangers below the arch during the construction phase were actually columns with very little load on it, but still columns nonetheless. And so we, you know, we left part of that to show just to, in, a, in a subtle way, which, you know, probably is not understood explicitly, but, but, but still felt you know, how this building was built or how it was put together and how, how it was expressed. You mentioned about it, it fitting in. I mean, that's, I was in um, Dubai last year for the, for the first time, mm-hmm. and it's quite an astonishing city. It feels as though it's a permanent construction site anyway with buildings just going up everywhere that, that you look but wow factor is definitely it the Burj Khalifa I thought was stunning beautiful to look at you couldn't take your eyes off it in a way I didn't want to go inside it because I only mm-hmm. wanted to just look at it it's very futuristic and I wondered before we get onto this you know structure that you had to do in order to make the world's tallest building are you inspired by science fiction? Because when I saw it, all I thought of was a city of the future. I enjoy science fiction. I, I, you know, a, lot of our, a lot of our influences are so subtle, we don't know they're there. Do I love the movie Metropolis by Fritz Lang from the 20s, which is about the future, which we still haven't quite gotten to? I mean, all that stuff is there. I don't know about it if exclusively, but... Uh, you know, it is all there, parked back in my brain somewhere. So you, you know, one's never quite sure where, where where these references come from. The Burj Khalifa was actually, you know, a highly technical issue, and and so what you see there is is a response to the to the technical demands, and also the uh, you know the, the the desires of the client and and the use of the building. What would you say was the most technical demand of that building? It's true of all, t- uh, not all, most tall buildings is that they're they're dominated by by how they resist the wind, and so uh, one of the things that we wanted to do is we wanted to design a building that would respond to the uh, and actually try to negate the, the forces of the, of the wind. And so, uh, what we did is we shaped the building in such a way that the wind forces well wouldn't wouldn't build up. Whenever the wind goes past an object, I don't care if it's a, a, a lamp post or a mountain, it, it happens at all scales. As the, as the wind goes past some bluff object, first, you know, the, the air will go to the left and to the right. And as it does, it creates these vortices, you know, these vortex streams that come off the building. And every time this happens, it'll create like a, a pressure differential across the building, which will make it want to rock from side to side. If you have if you have a, a building which, which has sharp corners and it's the same size from top to bottom, you 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 will have fairly organized vortices that are all happening in unison. And so what we uh, what we did on, on the on the Burj Khalifa, and it took us quite a while to get there. We sp- we spent a lot of time in the wind tunnel with this building. We would keep reshaping the building so that the, these vortices would would not get organized because the rate of the vortices is related to the wind speed, which you can't change. The wind speed does change as you go up and down the building, but it's related to the wind speed and then the width of the building and the shape of the floor plate. And so playing with the width and the shape, we were able to, to get, get the wind forces very, very low. They never got organized. And, and one of the uh, <laughs> interesting things was, um, when we won the competition, you know, we, we had based our, our, our initial scheme on some ideas we had from a project, some things we'd learned on a project in Korea. And immediately after we'd won the competition, I wanted to go into the wind tunnel, and we did. And it, it turned out the building didn't work. The motions were too big and the forces were too big. And it kind of reminded me of um, uh, the Adams book, uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. The cover of this, of the, the guide mentioned in the um, title of the book, it says, in bright letters, don't panic. So that's the advice we took. We did not panic, but we worked the problem as engineers should. And in the process of, of understanding why the wind forces were so big, we were able to change the building so much that we were able to go much, much taller than where we started. Because our initial design 
It was only around 518 meters tall, and we ended up at 828. So the, just the change in the height of the building during the design process uh, was taller than the Shard in London. I'd read about this, that the height of the building remained a secret while you were actually building it. <laughs> Why was that? Well, at the time, there, uh, you know, there was a red-hot competition in the world there to do the world's tallest building for, you know, by various developers. So, you, you, you know, it was, it, was, it was this big secret, and, you know, the, there was a lot uh, to this. And um, a couple of things came out of that. One is um, I kept on uh, noting other competitors that had announced their buildings around, and, I, and I'd look at them, and one by one, they all stopped. For various reasons, they didn't go forward. And, and so one of the things I study is not only how do buildings get built, but also why do buildings don't get built. And a, a lot of the, the buildings that, that were proposed that were never realized, in my mind, weren't realized because they didn't understand issues of scale, both the, the real estate market and, and structural systems. A lot of times they were, they were based on uh, an engineer making an architectural sketch, not fall over as opposed to having a design that was where the architecture and engineering ideas were developed as one. It wasn't, you know, the engineer coming in later to, to make something, like I say, not fall over. And, and so the, you know, th- those are you know, very, very important things that I learned from looking at what the other building, the other proposed ones, which were never realized. I remember on, on um, January 4th, 2010, which was the, the grand opening of the Burj Khalifa, I was in Dubai and, uh, you know, I was sitting off with this group of, you know, all the engineers and architects and uh, contractors, all the, all the big shots were over in another area. But, and I was sitting there feeling very smug because I knew the uh, height of the building. What I did not know is that they decided to change the name of the building. Until the day of the grand opening, it was called the Burj Dubai. You know, so I asked my friend, next to me, what, what is this about? And he said, ah, they've named it after Sheikh Khalifa, who, who is the, uh, um, the, uh, the head of the entire Emirates. So he, he's, but he's also in charge of, uh, of uh, Abu Dhabi. The design was driven by, uh, I would have to say it was driven by practical considerations and physics. And, and part of those practical considerations was this now famous buttressed core structural yes system mm-hmm. obviously you you try everything out beforehand you you know using models of the building and the wind tunnels and what have you what gave you the idea for this particular structure and maybe you could just describe it first we just finished a project in the korea uh it became quite obvious to me that some variation of that that idea could go quite high and, and so we started with a system very much like what we had done in, in Korea. But after a while, it became clear that it just wasn't right for this. And so what happened is, you know, you know the, the system morphed and, you know, it became more and more pure. It, you know, a building coming out of the ground is really just a giant beam coming out of the, out of the ground. And it, um, if you think of like an I-beam, you'll have, you know, a, a web that carries the shear and a flange just takes the overturning moment. And so instead of being an I, it's, it's with, you know, two flanges, it's a kind of a Y with three, three flanges and a web connected. And then one of the very, very important things is, is twist. You do not want to have a tall building that is torsionally soft. It needs to be very stiff torsionally. There's a, there's a lot of um, experience out there with buildings that were not torsionally stiff, having issues. And so, uh, so you need something to keep it from twist. And so we use the, this, the, the core in the middle of the building, like, like a big axle, it's a hexagonal shape, which is torsionally very, very stiff that goes up, but it was not stiff enough. It was good for torsion, but not enough to take the lateral loads. And so it, it was then buttressed, if you will, by, by the, the three wings of, of, of webs going down the corridors and, um, and then connected into flanges, if you will, or cross walls that were in, in the demising walls between the residential units and because this was primarily a residential building but the process i like is is keep things very when you're when you're starting your design keep it very open keep eyes ideas flowing all the time and then after a while when you think you're close to it when you think you're 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 onto something can you describe it in words okay 
And if it takes a lot of words to describe what you have, maybe you're not done. I think uh, uh, Mark Twain once said that my letter's going to be very long because I've had not time to make it shorter. Or I think Winston Churchill uh, uh, once said, I'm going to give a long speech because I have not uh, had time to prepare a short one. And making something uh, simple takes a lot of time. To reduce something to the essence, you know, you know, like editing your, your, your design down, down to, to, to its essence is a very important thing. And it's not easy. You know, making something simple is not easy. Anyway, but at, at some point, when you think you're there, describe it in words. And as I said, if it takes too many words to describe, maybe you're not there. But sometimes you can get down to perhaps two words, a noun plus an adjective. And if, I, and if I look at the work of some of my predecessors at SOM, like really Fazer Khan, who did, you know, the Sears Tower, now called the Willis Tower, you know, he described it as a bundled tube. In the Hancock Building, which is the x building here in Chicago, he, it was described as a trust tube. And those two words carefully selected describe the essence of the system. And so when we looked at what we had created, it appeared to me that, you know, the essence of it was a core uh, there in the center, which was essential for taking out the torsion, that, that, that was buttressed, buttressed by these three wings coming out of it. And so, so that, that, is, that is just the, the name that I gave it. And it's a very important because, and it's also very useful because if your ideas can be that clear, you can then describe it to your team and they know uh, what you're doing. You can describe it to the other disciplines, to the owner, to the contractor. And very importantly, uh, when you resolve conflicts, it tells you who gets the right of way. Tall buildings are all about conflicts, very, very complex, very, very, very complex things to build. And, you know, all kinds of mechanical, electrical, plumbing systems and circulation, vertical circulation and maintenance things. And, you know, an amazing number of um, things have to go in those buildings. And so you're, you're forever resolving conflicts. And, you, and a lot of times the the initial design for a tall building is like a train wreck. There's just so many things going on, and they're all in conflict. And as you resolve these conflicts, you have to decide well, you know, what's going to go through and what gets out of the way. And so for the real solid building show, it's, you know, the, you know, shall we say the structure got the right of way most of the time. In fact, all the time. And the rest, you know, was coordinated with. I mean, obviously, the, every, all of the other, the functionality has to work. Everything has to work. So... But, you know, the buttressed core was the essence that was not to be compromised. The Burj Khalifa, that began, started in 2004. But just a couple of years later, you also started work on another building in Dubai, the Kayan Tower, which is this <laughs> wonderful sort of helix shape. So were you working on both buildings at the same time? Oh, yes. I work on multiple buildings at a time. And certainly one building may take more time than others, but you know, I had you know, several designs going at the same time. I think in 2009, I had three buildings that were um, at that time in the, the 10 tallest buildings of the world open or, or top out. So, yeah, no, you work on, on multiple buildings at a time. You know, the Kayan Tower, that one was, was can, can you do a, a building that it mostly kind of relates to the wind where, where the shape of the building changes as, as you go up. And it, uh, if you're in London and, and you say you're taking the uh, above ground on, on one of the train surfaces, you look out there, a lot of times you see chimneys and chimneys will have what's called a strake. You'll have a wire that goes around the chimney in a helical manner, helical wire that is there to break up the vortex shutting I spoke about earlier. And uh, this, uh, this building essentially had this helical shape. It wasn't like a rectangle per se, but it was, you know, close to a rectangular-ish shape that, that rotated through 90 degrees as it goes, goes from bottom to top. And, and on that building, you know, of course, that greatly reduced the wind forces, but also uh, could, if you want to not careful, make the construction a bit complex. So a lot of the, a lot of the innovation there was how to make the, the, the construction simple. And so uh, basically we had the same set of formwork from top to bottom, Every, every lift, you go up and you kind of essentially rotate at 1.3 degrees. And then um, by the time you got to the top, you, you had your 90 degree ro rotation. So that was, actually, I have to say on that building, uh, uh, the structure was, was, was interesting and took a lot of work, but uh, the plumbing was also interesting. Every time you get off the elevator, you, you, um, the floor plates are essentially identical, but uh, you, you have to walk farther down the, so say unit B, okay? 
you have to walk, walk farther down the, the public corridor to get to Unit B because every every floor it's it's moved a little bit from where it was on the floor below. And uh, one thing uh, that we as who are educated as civil engineers know that uh, you, you have to respect gravity, okay? And so you know you have to get your your plumbing to work out. So that was, that was actually a bit more. That was one of the challenges we had. But eventually we were able to solve that problem also. You've designed so many buildings, including a Trump Tower, and you know you travel across the world. You're an international fellow for the Royal Academy of Engineering as well, and you're often at Cambridge. What would you say has been so far your favorite building? Ooh, that's a dangerous one. I won't, uh, you know, uh, I, uh, for many years, uh, worked with a man named Myron Goldsmith, who was one of my, my mentors. He was an architect engineer. He studied architecture under... Uh, Mies van der Rohe and engineering under uh, Luigi Nervi. That's kind of like an amazing combination there. And uh, he started S1 as a uh, chief structural engineer in our San Francisco office, but eventually went back into architecture. And uh, when I knew him, he was an architectural design partner. And he would always have these slideshows. And uh, he would always show the same slides. And uh, one of my friends asked him, I said, Myron, how can you always show you the same slides? Well, he said, well, they're, they're the only good ones, you know. And so one of my, my goals in life was that by the end of my career, I would like to have five slides, five buildings, five ideas. Uh, and I'm still working on the list, quite frankly. There's, there's a, uh, a few that I'm pretty sure are going to be on the list of the five. The Burj Khalifa certainly is one. In London Exchange House, which I'm very, very uh, uh, pleased with. There at Liverpool Street Station, you know, you know, you know we detailed every, every connection there. I remember working on that one, uh, we had a, a debate about how it should be detailed. It should have a, a machine aesthetic, kind of like Lloyd's of London had or something. Or, But we decided, um, in fact, this is Bruce Graham's uh, idea, is to have more of a structural aesthetic, like you, you would see uh, in, in, a, you know, in, a, in, a, in a true structural application like a bridge. And so and it's all exposed steel, except for, I mean, some of the, some critical elements are far proof, but... Uh, but in general, everything you see out there is you're looking strictly at the steel. Uh, others on the list of, uh, today are, are I did a uh, very nice little pedestrian bridge at, up in Calgary, Canada, is at least on the list of five for the moment. And, and there's a few other contenders. There's a little band shell I did in, on an island in the Mississippi River in St. Paul, Minnesota, which I like quite a bit. So uh, my five slides is still changing, but I, uh, I do have a, a lot of buildings on that are so important to me, but certainly the Burj and uh, Exchange House are going to be on that on that that final list. And you've had a you know twenty years at at SOM. You've obviously enjoyed it. You've obviously got to, you know, be part of some amazing constructions for budding structural engineers. What would be your best piece of advice? Well, part of it is. When an architect gives you a sketch, do not take it as something that you're going to go out and just immediately engineer. Take it as a problem statement. I need a building, or I need a canopy, or I need a skylight. As engineers, too often we are, we are trained to solve the problem given us. When in reality, maybe we should change the problem. And we know many things that the, the other people on the design team don't know, and we should we should exercise that knowledge to make make the project much bigger. So, so that that that's certainly one. And don't spend your career making a bad idea, not follow her. So I try to come up with uh, collaborators, uh, you know, architects and other disciplines that you collaborate with, where you, where you develop the ideas together. That that they're, that um, you end up with a um, you know designs with buildings where they're they're holistic. You know, you know they're. You can't separate the structure from the architecture because it's really one one idea and one building. Uh, another thing is don't get lost in linear thinking. And the other thing is look into designing the forces and not the structure. Can you design the forces you want, the equilibrium you want, and then see what the structure is that helps you achieve that? Turn the problem on its head and uh, do most of your plenary calculations by hand. I do almost all my t- all my major major buildings plenary calculations by hand because it makes me make the problem simple. And, 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 I, and I get down to the essence of what it is I'm designing. 
of course, we always go to the computer and, um, and, and maybe the computer will, will get a little different answer than you expect. And that's okay because you will now learn something that you would not have learned if you hadn't done the plenary design by hand. I probably have a very long list. The other thing, here's another one. If you're a student, this is the one for students, take as many theoretical classes as you, uh, as you can because theory is practical. When you're on the job, you can learn, learn about the practical things in life, but uh, you're not going to be able to teach yourself, you know, some of the higher mathematics or some of the other things. And because you might say today we live in a computational age, but soon I think we'll be in the post-computational age. And the value of the engineer is not the ability to, to be able to manipulate the computer or the box, uh, but to understand what, what is coming out of the box and why it is. And, that, and that, that's the stuff that, that will have a very long shelf life. It is just your fundamental knowledge. And your knowledge of fundamentals. Okay. <laughs> well, that's great. I think you've given really interesting advice there, although I, I did notice you've forgotten one to you add to your list, which is, of course, don't panic. Oh, yes. yes. Panic does not help. Okay. <laughs> uh, Bill Baker, thank you very much indeed for joining me on the Create the Future podcast. Thank you for having me. I enjoyed it very much. <laughs>